Ray Leto is famous for his 1979 book, Passion and Revolution, where he tried to show that our struggles against Spain and the U.S. weren't just led by big men, but fueled by the masses. And he tried to show that by using the words they used in their passion plays. His newest book has been in the works for more than 10 years, and he says the inspiration to finally finish it was President Duterte's anti-Americanism, which dovetails with Ilato's critical view of America's role in our history and in our continuing drama. Ray Ileto, thank you very much for spending this time with us today. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So you were working on this book for at least 10 years, mm -hmm. um, putting it together. Um, and then President Duterte came on the scene and you found that to be, uh, to help you find the thread of this book and help you finish it. How did that come about? Well, it, it's not just his uh, statements about the Philippine-American War uh, and his so-called anti-Americanism. No, it's the fact that he, he was a mayor who then became president because uh, I was working, I, I've been working on the Philippine-American War at the local level, you know, where it really happened, you know. Who, how did, for example, the uh, Southern Tagalog resistance continue beyond the surrender of Aguinaldo? How did Malvar manage to keep it going, and there you have to look at what was going on at the munici municipal level. And it turns out that the, uh, the ability to sustain the, res sustain the resistance was uh, largely due to the uh, participation of the local officials. The mayors were the most successful guerrilla leaders and the barangay chiefs, together with, of course, a few illustrados and, and professionals. But I was struck by the role of the local mayors who also, who were in a way uh, prepared to lead guerrilla outfits because they had also, even during Spanish time, they had control of, uh, of the police, the cuadrilleros. And so they had the experience of leading men in battle and knew how to communicate. And then suddenly uh, this guy comes along and he's a mayor and he's also famous for kind of being able to lead his police force successfully in Davao. I mean, that was one thing I was challenging, the uh, depiction of Philippine politics as based on a critique of caciquism and the strongman rule and the role of warlords. I'm trying to provide an alternative to that. I'm trying to show that that discourse of politics actually has something to do with American pacification methods. And here you have a president who is being depicted as a strongman and a warlord, but there's more to it than that. You know, we joke about Filipinos being mental colonies yeah. of the U.S. And in the book you talk about needing to decolonize ourselves from that. Why is that important? Why is it important to uh, get away from that or at least have an alternative view? Because the world is changing. I mean, uh, now it's very clear that we are moving towards a more, a more a multipolar, more multipolar world and America is no longer actually the sole superpower and so we, we, we need to we need to revise our views of the relationship between the Philippines and the, and the United States and, and, and I just found it refreshing that the president was willing to open up to countries that were previously taboo to Philippine relations with <laughs> China Russia. Russia yeah and that's very uh, it's a very positive move uh, very clever but a bit dangerous but You've, um, you've had your uh, battles with other historians uh, who criticize your view uh, of the Philippine-American relationship or even of, uh, of the, Spanish, the, uh, the Philippine Spanish War yeah. and how the Filipinos uh, um, prosecuted that war. Is this a case of having an alternative view or having a correct view? No, it's actually having a, a deeper view of the, of the, of the past because my, my disputes with other scholars have to do with uh, the reasons why Filipinos resisted, for example, the Americans. Uh, and and the, the, more, the more dominant view is that it's because they were coerced, so they, they, they did it out of uh, you know, this habit of being obedient to their, to their, to their to their landlords or their uh, elites. And I've been trying to understand what was it about these local leaders that made them not just feared, but attractive, that, that made people follow them, you know, because they, they were convinced that 
that this man or, or whoever it was was leading them in the right direction. So I, I, I try to analyze rhetoric, what they say, and, and this means, you know, reading their uh, speeches, you know, in, in Tagalog, for example, in the vernacular. You talked about um, local leaders, and in reading your book, I got to know very briefly, in not, in not so many pages, yeah. people like Norberto Mayo, uh, Ladislao Masangkay, and a little bit more about General Miguel Malvar. Yeah. Um, I guess my frustration with a lot of uh, with Philippine history as a subject of study is we, we seem to lack um, pure history and pure biography. Why is there a lack of that? Well, it's not always easy to get at all the records. I mean, a lot of the records of the Philippine American War are still in the U.S. military archives, and I have access them. Um, but more, the Philippines already has uh, enough to do more work on them. I, I, I don't know what the reasons for this um, uh, situation are, but it, it's got to do perhaps with the fact that there are certain names that are well established in our minds as being heroes, like Luna, and, and so we have a movie about Luna, and they're trying to to uh, film something about Malvar as well. But really, uh, there is so much that we can do. And I was just, and I, I've, I've given an example of what one can do for a cluster of towns. It's Chahong, Candelaria, Sariaya. Most Filipinos have probably never even heard of these towns. And I'm showing that this produced, you know, they're very effective uh, leaders in the war against the Americans. But I focus not really on their personalities, but on their relationship with, with the people around them. Why, how did they become effective? Why were they effective? I think so that's, it's, it's I think them that's, in society, not them alone as, as individuals. Um, how can Filipinos learn that story more if uh, we don't have more history and biography about those people? I guess we just need to be more committed to to this project of uh, bringing the American, Philippine-American war back into the mainstream. But I also analyze why it has been pushed back into you know, the, the realm of uh, forgetting. Uh, it's, there was a, it has there to was do a, with colonial policies. <clears throat> and, there's a strategy and a purpose to that. Yes, there's a history to that. And uh, there's also a history of resistance to that. There's also been a history of attempting to bring it back. Uh, you talk in the book about uh, Tidor Agoncillo. Gonsilio was a pioneer, was a pioneer and, and brought, that, brought okay. it back into the mainstream uh, of, of national consciousness through his books and a few others. So before mm -hmm. him, what the, I think the picture that you've painted there is that before him, um, anybody who went through the Philippine education system would have known little or anything about the Philippine-American War. They would have seen it as uh, at best a, a big misunderstanding, you know, that if the <clears throat> the Filipinos like Malvar, if they only knew that the Americans came with good intentions, they wouldn't have bothered to, bother to resist. In other words, it's, it's already been kind of packaged for the new colonial uh, studentry and until, new generation. Until, yeah. as, the chapter, as, as the chapter of your book says, mm. until the return of Andres Bonifacio, care of... Yeah, uh, it started with the Quezon period, but I think the, the Japanese occupation, ironically, was a turning point because during the Japanese occupation, as part of their cultural campaign to, to sort of, to kind of pull the, Ameri the Filipino, Filipinos away from their attachment to America, which was Japan's enemy, they encouraged uh, writing about the Philippine-American War and they encouraged the veterans to speak out, and they did. And Laurel was part of that as president? You know, Laurel saw that as a positive thing. Yeah. And afterwards, as, yeah. the, as the founder of the Lyceum University. Yes, this is just a continuation of his, uh, you know, of his initiatives during the Japanese occupation. Where Duterte was a student. In the oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I saw the connection there, that Duterte would have picked, picked up this, this perspective as a student. At Lyceum. When you listen to President Duterte, Mm -hmm. How strong is that strain of thought? I think it's consistent. I think it's really, I mean, it's not something that he tacks on to his speeches. I think he really has, has, you know, has had this in mind for a long, long time. And I think it goes back to his student days in the late 60s. And he said he was a member of the Kabatang Balbayan, you know, the KM, but would have also kind of, you know, firmed up uh, his, his views about the American intervention. Your last chapter is. Uh, is about, uh, it's called The Boss, boss, boss mayor. mayor. The Boss Mayor. Yes. The Boss Mayor and his critics. Yeah. And you talk about how you and how other historians look at uh, local leaders. 
Is there a connection between that and the kind of, shall we say, authoritarianism that this boss mayor that we have now practices? I don't know if you can call it authoritarianism. It's a bit too early to, to, uh, to put that label on, on, on him because uh, it's, he may just be doing what is necessary in, to, in order to achieve his goals, having experience trying to put an end to the drug problem in his own constituency. I mean, he, he has to take a firm hand. But uh, no, I, I ref that, that thing about uh, just kill your enemies, that's, that's, the, um, that's the dominant uh, theme in some of the most influential political science writings we've had on the Filipino local elites, that they're just warlords, they're, you know, they're corrupt. And, and of course, there are so many examples we can give of that, right? I'm trying to provide a counter, a, you know, a, a kind of an alternative to that. And I'm also showing that that image of the uh, rural elite, the municipal uh, leaders, was something that emerged during the Philippine-American War, when the American generals were you know, getting frustrated at, you know, how come these towns, they won't submit? How come they're continuing to resist? It must be because those, those bosses, those mayors, are, are, are whipping their constituencies into into fighting the Americans, you know, they're forcing, they're forcing the people to fight us. Therefore, we must teach them a lesson. We must, you know, we must do something about these local elites. And so they did. You know, uh, some of them turned around and became pro-American, and those who didn't were given bad names. You know, the cacique, the uh, hopeless uh, tyrants. And but your point is that these are just some of the many uh, yeah. mayors that we had. Some of whom yeah. might have been. Yes, I mean, okay. say the, the whole variety of local leaders that we've had, and I've seen some of them, you know, in my in my own experience with, with Panawan politics. Um, I've, I've seen some good ones and some not so good ones. But why do, why is the theory about local uh, politics based on uh, kind of a negative image of the local elites, as if they're the ones hampering progress and development, when in fact they could be the drivers? What I'm trying to say is that within the town, it, you know, there may be a boss mayor, but they, there are also other elements, including the parish priests, including the local, I call them the rural illustrados, the teachers. They may, you know, they're, they're also part of the town elite, and they provide, they can provide a counterweight uh, to, to uh, the uh, excesses of, uh, of a boss mayor, and they can even become boss mayors. I even you know, suggest that if, if Rizal had not been executed and returned to Columba, uh, he would have ended up being boss mayor of Columba. He had all the uh, qualities for being a mayor. In other words, uh, I think I'm against stereotyping. Uh, stereotyping, and I think what we are seeing today is also the imposition of stereotypes on on the activities of this of the present uh, of Duterte. You know, uh, we're seeing him through 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 other lenses, instead of taking him on his own terms and trying to understand where he's coming from and what he's trying to tell us about how someone with the experience of being mayor for 23 years, what that can bring into the running of national affairs. Of course, there are negative as well as positive aspects of this, but we must learn to listen and understand, understand what's going on. One of the most interesting parts of the book is the chapter where you talk about your father. Your father, we should remember, was uh, was the head of the army yeah. and then vice uh, vice chief of staff during the early part, in the lead up to and the early part of, of martial law. And you say in the book that some of your conversations, particularly about martial law, could get emotional. Uh -huh. um, how yeah. would you compare that, the martial law then, with the kind of leadership that we are experiencing now? That's not in my book. <laughs> but, I mean, the reason I brought in my father, uh, one of the main reasons in, for the chapter is to introduce a section on remembering, forgetting the Philippine-American War, because my father didn't know, practically knew nothing about the Philippine-American War. He didn't even know that his father, my Lolo, were, was involved in the war. He was, the Americans had intercepted his, uh, one of his letters and had branded him a spy for General Torres. But my father didn't know about it. So it's an example of how a forgetting of the war made it even easier for him to, to become very pro-American and to, you know, to look up to America as the source of ideals. And about Marcos, that was a different era because that was part of the Cold War. Uh, I think martial law should be seen as 
part of an era where practically every other leader in this part of in this part of the world was like him. There was, you know, the, 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 the anti-communist forces were setting up authoritarian leaders everywhere. Was, everywhere there was a, a threat of so-called communism, and so. But that's that's not the case now. It's a, it's a different kind of situation. I don't know exactly what it is now, but it's not the same as as martial law in in the 70s, where there was a cold war that kind of. I mean, it it it, it's, it is. That's what my father was referring to because he was a Cold War warrior and he saw the need for martial law in order to stem the the growing influence of the left in the schools and the universities. Is there, um, if you look at, if you look at today, mm. would there be a justification for some kind of martial law um, situation? Well, I, I, it's it's a pity that we call it martial law because it conjures up images of Marcos and martial law, and it's not the same because the new constitution, the 1986 or 87 constitution, has put a lot of checks on uh, on, on the uh, on the things that the, the president can do in, in imposing emergency rule. It's not the same. There's so many limitations now. And also, uh, we must try to understand first what the, what the problem is. You know, what, what, what I, I, I personally think that this the, the threat uh, this so-called terrorist threat is, is very real and it's very serious, and it involves it involves outside powers. It's not just the Philippines and the, this, the, you know, this this so-called terrorists. It's it's got to do with uh, global politics. Great, great. Thank you very much for spending this time with us. Oh, thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks. Thanks.